You're listening to Library Out Loud, recorded at Albert Wisner Public Library in Warwick, New York, on September 30, 2015, by Susan Supak. We're talking with comedians Will Durst and Johnny Steele, who, along with comic Larry Bubbles Brown, are the focus of a documentary featured at this year's Woodstock Film Festival called Three Still Standing by Robert Campos and Donna Lo Cicero. Johnny, could you tell us a little bit about the premise of the documentary? Sure, I can. Uh, although, we're, we're in a library, so I feel like she's <laughs> I don't want the librarian coming over here. Uh, I don't. Um, yes, the premise of the film is San Francisco was, New York and Los Angeles, of course, were where film and TV was, and a lot of comics went there. But San Francisco, along maybe with Boston a little bit, but San Francisco was the epicenter of inventive, groundbreaking comedy from the late 70s, probably to the early 90s. There's a lot of great comics today there, so I don't want to say only that period. But there was a huge boom. Four clubs in the city, six or eight outside, another 50 rooms within a 25, 30, 40 mile radius that you can drive to. Late in the 70s, Robin Williams and some other kids went out to a small rock and roll club in the outer avenues of San Francisco and started doing comedy sets during the band breaks. They became so popular, the musicians were heaved out and it became a comedy club, and other comedy clubs grew from that, and Robin was snagged off to do Mork and Mindy, and every comic in the country said, obviously things can happen there, obviously because of Robin Williams and Dana Carvey and all these other comics who are popular there, they do seem to buy a strange, alternative, artistic, groundbreaking brand of humor. So all these comics flock there. This is about that boom, how it started, kind of how it died. And three guys who I like to joke about <laughs> were too stupid to go to LA and get rich and famous. Will Durst, who was here with us, me, Johnny Steele, and Larry Brown. We loved San Francisco so much and we loved comedy in San Francisco so much that we sort of didn't go to LA during that sort of 22-year-old to 39-year-old window of opportunity that, mm. where you need to go to LA and become rich and famous. So now, in our 50s and 60s, we're struggling to stay alive and stay relevant. That's the doc. All right. Well, Will, you have a marvelous quote from the documentary that says, comics are like blues musicians. We get better with age. Can you talk a little about that? Well, it's true of any artist, and comics are artists. And that was one of the things that Johnny was talking about San Francisco, that it, uh, you know, we can, the city considered stand-up an art form. And, and when you do something long enough, you know, uh, you get better at it because you know all the things that can go wrong, you know, little tricks. You have, you have such a backlog of material and, you know, nothing phases you anymore. And your confidence in pretty much any situation is uh, pretty high. So that, that's one of the things. And, and because of today's, you know, youth-based culture, which we baby boomers help create, so it's one of those hoist on your own petard things, but, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of been disposed of except for little niche markets, and fortunately, San Francisco, because we spent so much time there, we didn't go to L.A., we didn't go to New York, so we spent time in San Francisco, so we kind of have residual draws for people who were frequenting the comedy clubs back at the time. They know who we are, they know our names, they know what to expect. And they will come out to theaters, they won't necessarily go back to comedy clubs, because the comedy clubs speak to their own generation. You know, the average age of the audience of a comedy club is 18 to 35, is now, has been, forever shall be, amen. And, and so it's marketed to those young people and it's frequented by those young people and they want to see comics. You know, they don't want to see me on stage. I can still make them laugh. Johnny can still make them laugh. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as soon as they see my little gray beard on stage, oh, give it up, Grandpa, you know. It's not. It's partly that and it's partly that um, what the clubs want to draw is this younger audience because I've seen the, the, the sort of demographic studies on this. They go out more frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere between, uh, you know, at around 21, uh, people start going out once a week, and then twice a week, and then three times a week, and then somewhere around late 20s, early 30s, they're going out four and a half times a week. And when they go out, they're having three or four or five drinks. Mm -hmm. That number gets to around 34, and it drops off precipitously. People get married. They have jobs. You know, you can't have three cocktails on a weeknight anymore. Your body doesn't handle it. You use a risk of getting a DUI or something. So not only do the younger people go out more, but then they also enjoy more cocktails. And so that what makes the clubs want them. Will can kill with 22-year-olds uh, as late as he can with 62-year-olds, but 22-year-olds go out more and 
buy more booze. Well, how's the internet and YouTube and that? How's that changed things for you? Um, we have major presences on the internet. Uh, I write a column every week that goes up, and it's it's uh, uh, syndicated by websites and. And we do commentaries, and we put up uh, gigs and sets and stuff. Uh, but the kids are so conversant with the internet. You know, the social media thing to them is is beyond second nature. It's instinct, and for us, it's such a. For me, it's such a. I'm sorry. For me, it's a <laughs> grind doing Facebook every day. I don't yeah. care about me. You know, it's all me, 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 and and my thing is observations about. You know, making fun and mocking and scoffing and taunting the rich and famous. You know, not, not, not. It, I don't care about me. And whatever medium we're using, we're still trying to draw 50 and 60 year olds out of their beautiful homes on a rainy night. I mean, the, the Woodstock Film Festival people are so lovely. They put me in a house. I'm a guitar player. They put me in a house of a professional musician. I walk in. There are like eight thousand dollars worth of guitars, and the note from the guy was, "Let Johnny play them." My wife had to drag me out of the house today. Yeah. You have, we have a bottle of wine. I've got 22 guitars. So this is what you're fighting. Younger people, <laughs> younger people. You know, they live nine to an apartment, and and they want to go out, and they're single, and they're chasing members of the opposite sex, or the same sex, whatever you're into, I don't really care. Um, so yeah, even though we have the internet, we're still, and we all have a presence, you're still, A, you got a demographic that isn't on it 24 hours a day like kids are, and then B, you're still trying to draw middle-aged people out of their cozy, warm homes when they've got 150 channels and a bottle of hooch in the counter. I heard in the documentary a quote from Robert Robin Williams about the comedic recession. Is that something that's still going on, or is that something that affected you more in the 1980s? No, the 80s were great. Uh, cable discovered how cheap it was to produce comedy back in the middle 80s, you know, at the nascent, uh, you know, when it, embryonic stage of cable. And you don't have to pay writers, you don't have to pay music fees, comics are self-contained, they write their own stuff. And, and it's a man and a microphone. You could put two frontier. comics. You could put two comics on a half-hour comedy show. Pay us like what, eight hundred bucks, and then you deepen your contract. They owned it to the year like seventy-nine million. No, and no, it it actually says in the contract throughout the universe in perpetuity. It's a long yeah. time. It's a while. That means if the, <laughs> if they find life on Jupiter, the yeah. Jupiterians are comedy <laughs> fans. We still don't get paid. And now that there's water there, there's a big chance I'm going to be huge <laughs> on the dark side of Mars. But it's. <laughs> So yeah, so so the it dark was, side, yeah. So it was, it was huge, and and then a number of other factors happened. It's, for for younger people, this is hard to imagine, but there was a time when you didn't have 150 channels of television and a TV screen as big right. as a billboard, and you could go to your TV now with on demand on Netflix and whatever. I can go on Netflix at home and pull up probably 25 comedy specials. I can go on YouTube and pull up dozens, hundreds of comics uh, doing comedy, and and so all of that. Sort of, and then the recession, you know, that's been going on for 10 years now. Mm -hmm. People are a little tighter with their dough. All of that worked to sort of beat it back. And in San Francisco, I know we're talking about San Francisco a lot. In San Francisco, the clubs then were, cons were bought up by a corporation. The clubs had almost all been locally owned. And a corporation saw a profit in that, and it mm -hmm. came in and bought the club. So whereas we personally knew the owners of the Punchline and, and the booking agent at the Punchline and Cobb's Comedy Club and the other cafe, the, club, the, the corporations that came in and bought those clubs mm -hmm couldn't care less about us. They're booked out of Los Angeles. And they're probably co-joined by you know, people who own uh, Comedy Central. So they put their talent up right. in our town, not us. And it's, and it's ancillary, you know. I mean, uh, you know, the, all, the, all the stuff, that, the tangential stuff, you know, where, where uh, a local comedy club would sponsor like a, a benefit or something and have the local guys and that and you know it responds to the community mm -hmm. now they don't do that so much because as Johnny said they're booked out of new but the recession the recession hit a couple of reasons because it was so fertile it was so fecund when the comedy when it first started on on cable because there were so many comics who had gotten their chops down in the early 80s. So when they tapped into the market in the middle 80s, there were a lot of comics who knew what they were doing. And then they, they cycled through all the guys who knew what they were doing, and then they started 
because of the popularity of comedy brought a lot of new people in, and these kids didn't they didn't have time to cure on the road, <laughs> yeah. and they were doing all the same stuff, and, and it was kind of, uh, you know, they all look alike, they all want to be Seinfeld, they all want to be sweater comics, and they all sound alike, yeah. and then there was a dip, and then there was a, another comeback, because it's all waves. It's all There's another wave going on right now, mm. and this was after the, conve- the confessional wave started by... Uh, Janine Garofalo and and uh, Brian Cusain and, and all Ross those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mark Marriott. So they're the old guys now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. So it's cha- it's changed. In San Francisco, yeah. there are a lot of very funny uh, comics. We just had Comedy Celebration Day, which is one of the Will's wife produces it. It's in Golden Gate Park. It's free. It goes on for five hours. Everybody from Robin Williams to George Lopez uh, has performed at it. Mm-hmm. And I watched the first half of the show was young comics, and some of them are very inventive and very funny. The difference is. There isn't any commercial aspect to it anymore. I don't think these kids are making a living, and I don't think anybody is is coming to town from the Montreal Comedy Festival to look at them and take them out on the road. So sort of the commercial end of the of the business of San Francisco comedy has sort of fallen out. I don't think you can move there, be funny, work on your chops for two years, and then suddenly start making a living anymore. I don't so think so. So what would be your advice to a young person who wants to be a comic? I should then? get a job in the library trades. <laughs> the library industry is just where you need... Uh, yeah, have a trust fund. <laughs> and surprisingly, a lot of the new comics are... You know, they come from wealthy oh, yeah. environments because there, as Johnny said, there is no middle class anymore. You either make nothing or you're a huge star. We know a couple of comics who moved from San Francisco, not in the too uh, distant uh, past, and uh, they they couldn't even. They were barely middle acts in the in the Bay Area. They went down to L.A. They got a couple of breaks, got an agent, and now. They have their own TV shows and their stars and and they're big time. One, one of the ironies I think of, of what's happened to Will and and I think a few other comics is if you were a, a, a good comic and you were making a living and you were getting critical review and you and you were enjoying it, you stayed in comedy. If that wasn't happening for you, you went to Los Angeles, which of course is where all the money and the pop, you know opportunities are. So a lot of great comics died because. They didn't go to Los Angeles and make a national name for themselves and get on a TV show or create a TV show. And so when the scene, when the waters receded a little bit, they were left on the shore to be, you know, dehydrated or plucked by a seagull. So you're working now, you're finishing up on this. You finished up with the documentary that you you are both... Three still standing. They'll kill us if we don't remember to say that. Three still standing. And... uh, what is your, where are you going to next? Yeah. What are your plans next? We have been... Plans? Three, three, uh, Plan? Playoffs! <laughs> Playoffs! Oh, yeah. Oops. Um, three still standing. We, this, is, this marks almost a, a month uh, to the month uh, of a year of film festivals. We started at the Mill Valley Film Festival in early October of last year. We're so lucky to be invited to the Woodstock Film Festival. And I think this is our last. Film festivals are great. I love them. Uh, but you've got to eventually get your butt into <laughs> theaters because film festivals, what they sort of like is the exclu- they're offering the exclusivity of these films are not available outside film festivals. Um, which is great for film festival goers, but every time we perform somewhere, uh, people say, you guys are real funny. Now, is there some kind of movie? Where can we see it? And we're like, it's not available. Well, this seems like an odd marketing plan. <laughs> and we're like, well, I think you're right. <laughs> Doesn't make much sense. We're out pushing a new product. When's it available? We're not sure. Maybe never. So um, so well, next week, uh, uh, we, we actually premiere for the first time for a week in one of San Francisco's coolest art house in the heart of the Mission District, which is sort of the hipster neighborhood in town. Uh, the Roxy Theater, Three Still Standing, starts on Friday, October 9th. And after right. that, we just start spiraling further and further out of, of the or San down. Francisco. Or down. No, <laughs> not down. No, no Marin, <laughs> Santa Cruz, uh, San Jose. Down. These are big towns with big money right. people. So right. that's that's what we're doing. And we're all, of course, working on separate projects individually as well. Okay. But that's the future of the film. Well, thank you very much. So that's Will Durst and Johnny Steele, who are starring in the documentary Three Still Standing that's showing at the Woodstock Film Festival. Thank you so much. You promised me that these overdue fines would be eliminated <laughs> if I came on. Is that right? I don't, who should I talk to about that? Thank you, Susan Stupak. Stupak. No tea. No, Stupak. You got it.